afternoon, everybody. A couple of things at the top. First, I want to announce uh, the Secretary's uh, upcoming travel. Uh, Secretary Kerry will be in Cairo, Egypt, on the 2nd of August to co-chair the U.S.-Egypt Strategic Dialogue with Egyptian Foreign Minister Shokri. The bilateral dialogue reaffirms the United States' longstanding and enduring partnership with Egypt and will provide a forum to discuss a broad range of political, economic, security, and cultural issues to address uh, and, and issues of importance, I'm sorry, to each side and to further our common values, goals, and interests. On the 3rd of August, the Secretary will travel to Doha to meet with foreign ministers of the Gulf Cooperation Council. There he uh, will uh, engage with them uh, uh, on a wide range of security issues uh, throughout the region, not to, not to, of course, to include um, the Iran deal itself. Next, the Secretary will travel to Singapore on the 4th of August. Uh, to meet with senior government officials and leaders there to discuss bilateral and regional issues as Singapore marks 50 years of independence. The Secretary will also deliver a speech on the importance of U.S. trade and investment to prosperity in both the East Asia region and the United States. He will then visit Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia from the 4th to the 6th of August to attend the ASEAN Regional Forum. At the Regional Forum, the Secretary will participate in four multilateral meetings, including the Lower Mekong Initiative, U.S. ASEAN, East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum Ministers Meeting. From there to Hanoi, from the 6th to the 8th of August, where the Secretary will meet with senior Vietnamese officials to discuss bilateral and regional issues. He'll also participate in an event marking the 20th anniversary of the establishment of U.S.-Vietnam diplomatic relations. I also want to just make mention that today the Secretary will welcome 12 high school students from the Peshawar Army Public School in Pakistan, these young leaders are traveling to D.C. and New York State on a two-week international visitors leadership program on science, technology, engineering, and math. The Pakistani students are survivors of the December 2014 terrorist attack at the Peshawar Army Public School, uh, and this program underscores our U.S.-Pakistan cooperation and educational exchanges. With that, Matt. Can we start with, um, not the trip, although, about uh, the situ what's going on right now with um, the Turks. <clears throat> and it seems like a, a, a really bizarre situation has unfolded over the course of the past week with uh, them joining the airstrikes against ISIS, but at the same time also uh, bombing PKK positions. And there's been some pushback on the suggestion. I noticed that Brett McGurk tweeted about it, that uh, that these are related and that the United States, he saying that, that there was no deal done with the Turks, in other words. Um, a lot of people find that really hard to believe. So w w what exactly uh, is going on here? And doesn't this just make an even bigger mess out of, the situ out of the situation than you had originally? I think, so let's unpack. There's a lot a lot there, so let's just unpack that. Um, I don't think that I could say it any better than uh, Ambassador McGurk did. Um, we are grateful for Turkey's uh, cooperation against ISIL to include now uh, use of some of their bases uh, for coalition aircraft uh, to go against targets, uh, ISIL targets, particularly in Syria. So we're grateful for that support. Um, the Tur so separate and distinct from that, uh, Turkey has continued to come under attack by PKK terrorists, and we recognize their right to defend themselves against those attacks. Uh, and it was in retaliation for recent attacks by the PKK that uh, Turkey conducted these most recent strikes. Um, as for ISIL in Syria, we continue to discuss with Turkey uh, ways at which we can go after this particular threat. Um, again, we value their uh, cooperation thus far. They have a vested interest, obviously, because of its, it's their border. Um, and while there's nothing new to announce with respect to what kind of cooperation may come in the future, uh, we're going to continue to talk to them about that. I understand uh, the coincidence of all of this, but it is just that. Uh, the, uh, the 
attacks against the PKK were in retaliation for attacks they, the Turks, uh, uh, endured. And what they're doing against ISIL in Syria, I'll let them speak to. Uh, but obviously, we welcome all coalition members' efforts against ISIL, particularly in Syria. All right. Well, one, are you su suggesting then that the Turks, that the, the, the attacks on the PKK <clears throat> are going to, are, are over now, and that the Turks have retaliated enough for the, the, the attacks on them? Uh, and secondly, are, are you not concerned that these attacks, while they are directed against a group that you have designated a terrorist organization, the Turks certainly believe are a terrorist organization, and I'm talking about the PKK, are you not concerned that that is going to hinder, hurt the fight against ISIS, ISIL? I mean, understand the second one. Am I concerned that their attacks against the PKK will detract from the fight against ISIL? Is that? Yeah. They're killing people that are killing ISIL. The attacks against the PKK? Yes. Okay. Right? I mean, am I wrong? I mean, the PKK has been very effective against ISIL. They have rescued Yazidis on Mount Sinjar. <clears throat> They've been fighting ISIS yeah. in nope. Syria. I think I so, got it. I so, think I got so, it. There's so two, there's two in there. It, is are, it have over you been now? assured by, or have you been told by the Turks that they're, that this against the against the strikes against the PKK are at least limited duration and solely in retaliation for the attacks on them and right. are going to stop? And secondly, I mean, how is this not make it a big, you know, it's how, how does this not hurt the fight against ISIS? ISIS. Okay, so two so two questions. First of all, is it over now? I, I don't know. That's a question that you have to ask Turkish Turkish officials. They retaliated against the PKK for strikes that they that uh, uh, that they received from PKK terrorists. Um, we have long recognized the PKK as a foreign terrorist organization, and we recognize Turkey's ability, or I'm sorry, Turkey's right to defend itself against this group. Um, so is it over now? I don't know. I mean, and that's really not a question that we can answer from this podium. Uh, two, d does it hinder the fight against ISIL? Uh, what, what we're trying to focus on here is a coalition to go after ISIL, counter ISIL. I recognize that in some cases the PKK uh, have fought against ISIL, but they are a foreign terrorist organization. We've designated them that as a FTO. Um, and our fight against ISIL is not in cooperation with, coordination with, or communication with the PKK. Our fight against ISIL is with 62 other nations in this coalition um, uh, who are helping us go after these guys. And in, and in Syria, specifically, you know, and again, DOD is working a train and equip program to get a moderate opposition capable enough to go after ISIL inside Syria. So um, the fight against ISIL will continue. We are grateful for the con contributions of Turkey uh, and other coalition members. Uh, and the pressure that we're going to put on them, uh, regardless of what Turkey's doing against the PKK or will do in the future, uh, that's not going to diminish. Are well, you telling the Turks not to go after the PKK? Hold on, Roz, 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 I have one more here. The, so you're saying that it doesn't trouble you at all that the Turks are going after people who have been a very effect, perhaps the most effective on the ground against uh, against ISIS, ISIL. You don't you don't have a problem with that. I, and, and first there's of all, no I think coordination, I would, but there. So you're you're more would, comfortable with uh, working alongside Iran in Iraq than you are with the Kurds. And don't, is that correct? Matt, we're not working alongside Iran in Iraq against ISIL. We've made it clear there's no coordination on the ground in Iraq with Iran. I would take issue with your characterization that the PKK has been the most effective force against ISIL in Iraq. Go ahead. Um, um, I don't know that we would share that. This is a foreign terrorist organization. They attack Turkey. Turkey has a right to self-defense. We're recognizing that. The fight against ISIL is broader than this, broader than one group's efforts against ISIL. It's much bigger, deeper, and broader than that, and that's where our focus is. Ross? Is the U.S. telling Turkey not to go after the PKK if the PKK in Syria are going after ISIL? Yes or no? The PKK in Syria? Correct. What? Well, the PKK, as we right. observe them, right. are in northern, right. are operating in Iraq and inside Turkey. To 
to so you don't conduct know that attacks. They, you don't know that they are fighting inside Syria as well? I have no specific information. I know what she's referring to. I'm getting there. I have no information specifically about where the PKK may be inside Syria. In Syria, largely the counter-ISIL fighters are members of the YPG, right? Now, and the attacks that they rendered were against PKK, not the YPG. But does that mean that you're telling the Turks? Because now we have this complication inside Syria. Who is shooting at whom at this point? You're talking about this, yeah. re this recent right. claim of attack that, right. that, the, that, the, Turks Th that the Turks fired on YPG. So right. let me, so the, the Turks have said they're going to investigate that, and they have reiterated and clarified uh, that their purpose against ISIL, or their purpose inside Syria is against ISIL, not the YPG. Yeah. Now, They've said now, that themselves. Now, since we're, so, since we're inside Syria and we're talking about groups who may or may not be favored or endorsed by the U.S., what about Jubat al-Nusra, which the U.S. sanctioned back in 2013? Is the U.S. basically ignoring them as they continue fighting against ISIL inside Syria, or is the U.S. using this opportunity, since they're also a FTO, to go after them? The fight inside Syria is largely, almost completely, against ISIL. Al-Nusra, we, we, we consider an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, therefore a legitimate terrorist organization. Um, and to the degree that, and I think we've been, it's been, been clear through the last several years, to the degree that, that we have information that leads us to, uh, to be able to go after terrorists that are targeting our interests or the interests of our allies and partners, we're going to continue to do that. I'm not sitting here announcing a strikes against Al-Nusra, but nothing protects Al-Nusra from the long arm of the United States of America, as did nothing protected the Khorasan group and the, and the strikes that we, took, that we took against the Khorasan group inside Syria. But to be clear, the fight inside Syria is largely about ISIL, and the Turks themselves have acknowledged uh, that that will be their aim inside Syria, too. Now, I asked this on Friday. Is there a no-fly zone agreed upon by the Turks and the U.S. inside northern Syria, yes or no? No. Why not? Well, well we've talked about this as well before. I mean, uh, but in light of current reports and current suggestions coming from Ankara that this has been agreed upon, I'd like to give you the opportunity to explain exactly from the U.S.'s position what is going on there. Sure. Is there a no-fly zone or not? Uh, no. I no. It's the same answer yes a few seconds ago. No, there's no, there's no imposition, imposition of a no-fly zone, and we're not considering one. Uh, but what is under consideration, and I talked about this uh, to, to Matt's question, is you know, deepening cooperation with our Turkish allies to counter ISIL in northwest Syria. We're going to continue to talk with them about how to do that. I should also note, and I really don't like to get into military matters, but um, you're kind of dragging me there. The, there, is no, there is no opposition in the air when coalition aircraft are flying in that part of Syria. The Assad regime is not challenging us. ISIL doesn't have airplanes. So in a sense, what's happening over northern Syria is only coalition aircraft flying. And it's not a no-fly zone, and I'm not characterizing it that. But it's almost having the same effect as if there was one because only coalition aircraft are occupying that airspace. They're not being challenged, they're not being shot at. There's no other aircraft up there uh, other than coalition aircraft, which are focused on going after ISIL. One more. What about creating some sort of safe zone for Syrian refugees who had fled to Turkey? The Turks have been saying that they would like to see some of those refugees go back and that part of their discussions include setting up some sort of perimeter where these refugees would be safe from attack. Is that under consideration? Would that require U.S. troops going in to help preserve that, the boundaries of such a safe zone? I won't speak zone? to the military aspect of this. We continue to talk to the Turks about how to uh, better cooperate. I got you. I got you. I, I'm sorry. Just, just hang on a second. Uh, we continue to, to talk to the Turks about how to better cooperate along that border and against ISIL, and we'll continue to do that. I don't have any announcements today about what that's going to entail, uh, but we're, we are certainly cognizant of the fact that 
two million some odd refugees are are in Turkey, and the Turks are carrying a heavy load in trying to to deal with that. I can also tell you that, again, without trying to, uh, I'm not signaling some decision on a safe zone, not at all. But uh, to the degree uh, any of those refugees return home, and obviously we'd like to be able to see them return home too. That's the really that's the long term answer here. Uh, it, we want to make sure that that's voluntary. Just a quick follow-up on the effectiveness of the Turkish uh, uh, participation in the fight against ISIL and so on. Uh, it seems that it has been scaled back tremendously today because they are going after PKK positions and, and villages and so on inside Turkey. They are de you know, devoting a great deal of resources and assets to do that, and consequently they scaled back. Do you have any comment on that? Well, first of all, this is uh, – we said that Turkey has a right to defend itself against terrorists, and um, we recognize that, as do we, um, as, do, as does any country. Um, and I'll let the Turks speak to how they're going to go after uh, terrorists inside their borders. I, I, I'm, I, I'm loathe to give battlefield assessments, even of U.S. military. I'm certainly not going to do that for the Turks. Well, you deny the allegation that Turkey basically used uh, its part in fighting ISIS as a ploy just to go after the Kurds. I, I'm not going to characterize Turkish motives. It we we don't we don't observe a connection between what they did about going uh, after PKK and what we're trying to do as a coalition against ISIL. Today they're okay. <laughs> well, I'm fact, comfortable with that. And finally, there are reports today that uh, the Kurds, Kurdish fighters of all groups and so on, they have taken vast areas in the Aleppo area, taking it away from. Uh, uh, I, ISIL, yeah. due to you, part, uh, the coalition bombardment and so on. Could you comment on that, or could you give us more on information that they have been able, the Kurdish forces have been able to liberate a lot of areas yeah, that they've were been under? Yeah, they've been very effective. Uh, uh, in, in, in the Aleppo area. Uh, in the Aleppo area, with, with support from... Well, look, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not going to go through every spot on the map. Okay, I'm really, I don't want to get into battlefield assessments, but yes, and I've said this before, that the uh, counter ISIL fighters uh, in northern Syria have been effective. There's no question about it. I would also add, Saeed, that one of the reasons they've been effective is because of coalition air support, which will continue as they continue to press the fight against ISIL. It's not like they're doing this all on their own. There has been some coalition air support as well. You said that, that Turkey's response to the uh, to Turkey's bombardment of the PKK hideouts in northern Iraq yeah. are retaliatory, are in retaliation to what PKK had done. But now there are two questions. First, ISIS, the PKK attack killed only two Turkish officers, but we've seen two major ISIS attacks inside Syria. Why haven't we seen such a retaliation against ISIS from the Turks? Secondly, and the Turkey had I mean, to before you get to the second one, let me just kill the first one. Okay. You got to talk to the Turks. I, I'm, I cannot no, speak for another nation I'm saying, or the decisions that they're agree, making. You agree with the Turkish position that's in retaliation. One could ask, why would you agree with that, with the Turkish assessment that's in retaliation to the PKK, while ISIS has been killing many more Turkish citizens, and the Turkey has done pretty much nothing? To, I, I, I think to, I would. So I'm not going to characterize Turkish motives. Uh, uh, that they, they suffered an attack. By the PKK, they retaliated. What, what comes next, uh, that's for them to talk to. As for ISIL, uh, one of the reasons why we continue to have discussions with the Turks is to explore ways that we can work together with them through the coalition to go after ISIL. This is a country that has a, a, a border they're concerned about. They've got two million refugees. They've, allowed, they, they've agreed to host a train and equip site uh, inside Turkey, and now they've allowed us to have access to some of their bases to conduct uh, airstrikes and missions against ISIL inside Syria. It's not like they're not doing anything. And your question almost implies that they're just sitting on the sidelines, and, and that is not at all our assessment. They have certainly poured more bombs over the past 24 hours on the PKK hideouts than on ISIS. Well, look, I, every day is different in a war like this. I mean, there are, there are some days where our pilots don't drop uh, all their bombs either. I mean, Every day is different, and every member of the coalition contributes what they can, when they can, where they can. It's a coalition of the willing. We're not mandating it, um, and the, the Turks are cooperating, and the, they're coordinating, and they have agreed to do more. And we're just going to have to see where this goes in the future. As I said to the, uh, at the outset, we're going to continue to talk with them. We're going to continue to try to explore areas where that cooperation can improve, and we'll get there. My last question, sorry. Uh, w wouldn't you be worried that 
the Turkish contribution, mili mili the military aspect of the contribution to the fight against ISIL might actually complicate the situation further instead of you know, helping the fight against ISIS because the Kurdish people inside Syria, whom you see them different from the PKK, they are like practically an affiliate of the PKK and they have uh, said that they would not welcome a Turkish, Turkish intrusion inside their areas. Wouldn't that mm -hmm. really complicate this, the war? I mean, wouldn't that, because the only, one of, one of the very, one of the most effective ground partners you have in northern Syria are the Kurds, if they don't welcome Turkish uh, contribution. Right, and that's, that so that's one of the reasons why we're going to continue to talk to the Turks about how to move forward here, so that, the, so that the mission can be achieved and that the complications are kept to a minimum. I think everybody understands, and we've talked about this before, that the situ how, how complicated the situation is in Syria. We're not blind to that. That's why we're having these discussions, and that's why we're going to continue to look for ways to, uh, to improve the cooperation. Margaret, you've been patient. Thank you. Um, Kirby, when you – you made clear no-fly zone off the table not being considered. So it's not being considered. Right. But can you help me understand when Turkish officials say that their understanding of what this ISIL-free zone would require would be air cover to right. protect refugees and the Free Syrian Army? Is sure. that part of the conversation being entertained by the U.S.? We are, again, looking for ways to, to talk to the Turks about how to get after – the ISIL threat better in northern Syria. We're not using the phrase ISIL free zone. We're going after ISIL wherever they tend to go right now. They seem to be gravitating along that border, gravitating toward to the to the west. So I think it's fair to say you can expect to see more coalition effort and energy placed uh, against uh, that area because that's where ISIL is. We want to hit them where they are. Um, what what the military components of that look like. I'm just not able to say right now. We, the, we're, we're still in very early stages here of talking to the, to the Turks about what that would look like and, and how it would play out. Um, but as I said to Raz, I mean, the, the coalition aircraft are not being challenged in that area of Syria. We don't expect that that, 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 that will change. And so right now, right now, um, a no-fly zone is not uh, under active consideration. But as we've always said, we're going to continue to talk to the Turks. We understand their concerns. Um, and we know they share our concerns about where ISIL's operating there along that northern border with, uh, uh, with Turkey. But when you say no-fly zone not being considered, that is not the same thing as saying any use of air cover is not being considered. Well, there's already air power being used against in northern ISIL. Syria against right. ISIL. I think but you can expect to see that. the free Syrian army, which is what the Turks want. Well, I, I won't now. You, now you're drawing me into specific tactical things that the Pentagon's better to speak to on the on the moderate opposition. I think we've always said we know once they get into the fight, we we're going to have to support them in some way. What that support looks like and how it and how it's actually produced um, are decisions for the Pentagon to speak to. And and I don't know that even those decisions have been made. But air air power, again, I want to just stress air power over Syria in that area, Syria, where we're fighting ISIL, is not being challenged. Right. But if, if the, as you say, if forces are brought in there, the Western trained forces are brought in there, and refugees come in there, there would be a, a change in circumstance and 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 we would have to, we would have to make decisions to that. then. It's a hypothetical. So if that all were to occur, I'm sure that uh, particularly Pentagon leadership would have to make some decisions about, about what that does, how that changes the uh, the uh, situation tactically, but I wouldn't be in a position right now to speak to that. Sure. Uh, in your base, uh, will the uh, coalition uh, jets, manned or unmanned planes, will be also helping PYD forces, the ones that take off from the injured base? Is You're this about the YPG? These are the counter-ISIL fighters yeah. in northern Syria. YPG. They They have already benefited from coalition air support. Yes. The fact that uh, we now have access to bases in Turkey will allow for that support to, uh, to be more timely and perhaps even more effective. So I would expect that that kind of air support will continue. Right. Uh, do you have any update on the numbers of the train and equipment? Uh, are there new recruits there? Uh, can, can I'd have anything? to refer you to the Pentagon. Over the weekend, President mm -hmm. Assad gave some uh, some talk and talk about the shortcomings of his army for the first time, as recorded since the war. Do you do you have any comment on that? Whether 
uh, some are good. That no, I mean, I'm not going to, yeah. you know, I, I, I saw those comments as well. I mean, it's not my place to speak to Mr. Assad's military woes. I mean, uh, nothing's changed about our position. He's lost legitimacy to govern. He needs to go. What needs to happen is a political settlement uh, uh, inside Syria that, that produces a government that is responsive to and respectful of all Syrians. That's what we're after here. It's not going to be solved militarily, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to make comments based on his, his characterization of his own military. My final question. In light of the new reports that showing that the Assad regime has been using chemical weapons still with the barrel bombs and other means, and hundreds of, of, of them since the March within the last few months, do you still find uh, your uh, agreement with the Assad chemical weapons are uh, successful? Well, yes. But what, what we know is that 100 percent of the declared stockpiles were removed and neutralized. Uh, so yes, that was an enormous success to get all that declared stockpile material out of Syria and to get it neutralized so that it could no longer be used against human beings. We've also said that we recognize he continues to brutalize his own people, um, and in including uh, the potential use of chlorine gas against his own people. And when chlorine is used in that way, it's, it's still a violation, even though it's an industrial agent. Um, and so those concerns, you know, while we're glad we got all those declared stockpiles out, we're certainly cognizant of the fact that he continues to find uh, brutal ways uh, to kill and maim his own people, and another reason why. He's lost the legitimacy to govern and needs to step down. What discussions are underway between the U.S. and other countries about trying to get to that political assessment? Last week, the secretary said that he would soon be meeting with Sergei Lavrov ostensibly to talk about Iran, but I would imagine Syria might come up as sure. well. Well, look, these are discussions Secretary Kerry has routinely with uh, his counterparts all over the region, and um, and I would fully expect that when he meets with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov at the next opportunity here uh, in a week that. Uh, Syria will certainly come up, as it does almost every time he talks to, um, to Mr. Lavrov. Is there any new push, any new initiative to try to get to a post-Assad Syria? I, I don't have, like, an announcement to make today, Raz. This is a, 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 what's going on in Syria with respect to Mr. Assad and ISIL is a constant topic of conversation and discussion and consideration. And, I mean, I, I don't have, again, I don't have a you know, a formula here for you. It's a very complicated situation, but is one that occupies a lot of Secretary Kerry's time. Marianne? Sure. I mean, we're not looking for some announcement, but I don't think most of us have seen a kind of concerted new effort, given that Assad is facing some wa battlefield losses. His regime looks increasingly wobbly, and we have heard a recognition of this from you and, you know, some of your coalition partners. So if, you know, you say that there's no formula, and I understand that, but, you know, should Assad fall tomorrow, it seems that there are absolutely no pieces in place for what would happen. And, and I think the question is, are there, um, you know, new efforts being made to try and find some political solution for the inevitable day that he would fall? I think the way I'd answer you, Lisa, is could become sooner rather than later. Uh, well, I, I can't speculate about the sooner versus later. What I can tell you is there's been continuous efforts. Um, here in the interagency, in the U.S. government, as well as throughout the interagency, um, to try to get at the very complicated situation in Syria and to get at um, uh, potentials for uh, a negotiated political settlement that that leads to a government that's more responsive to the Syrian people. So it's not about new, it's about continuous. I and, understand continuous, and, but given the changes on the battlefield, you would think that there may be more of increased or enhanced efforts? I think it's fair to say that. I, th I think it's fair to say is that, that. Is there that, a new urgency about this? I, I think it's fair to say that everybody shares the same sense of purpose about what's going on inside Syria. And the situation changes all the time there. Um, to say that recent reporting that. Uh, it's just reporting. It's no, you I mean, said I, it yourself. But to say that recent developments 
would lead to something new, I, I think would sort of undersell the amount of energy and effort that's already being applied to this problem. On, on the opposition, on getting the opposition ready for a transition. Well, I mean, I, again, I, the, we're very committed to this train and equip program for the opposition, but we're I'd let the Pentagon. about the train and equip program. If Assad were to fall, there's zero political opposition ready to take over. I mean, there's been, you know, you know, when this first started five years ago, there was like a, you know, demonstrable, concerted, um, program to work with the political opposition, and we barely hear about that anymore. So I know you're training and equipping, and the numbers yeah. are very small, but if Assad were to fall politically, there's there would be a complete vacuum. Well, again, I'm not going to make predictions about how soon, if or when he falls. The work with coordination with partners to include leaders of the opposition continues, and we're going to have, I mean, nobody's lost a focus on this. Is it your assessment that, that the fall is imminent? I'm not prepared to make that yeah, uh, assessment. I'm not prepared to make that assessment. Can I ask two really brief ones on this? Uh, on this. One, um, did, does the United States, does the administration still believe that the whole chemical weapons deal was a success? You said that 100 percent of his declared stockpiles were are, are gone, but in fact it's become clear that he didn't declare 100 percent of his stockpiles. So say he only declared 75 percent of his stockpiles, and 100% of the 75% is gone, but he still has got 25%. I, I don't see how that's a success at all. I mean, I see that you got rid of some of it, but he's still using it. So one, is it still a success? Is that your position? Yes. And, then I, okay. and, and there then, weren't weapons. It was chemical material. There's a big difference. Well, I've seen reports that say that suggest it's not just the chlorine that, that, was, that wasn't declared as and I know that it well, I mean, be, if he's not declared it, I mean, it's uh, difficult to give, get into yeah, a percentage. Yeah, but he basically trusted the guy to declare everything that he had, and he didn't. And now he's using it, and you're, and you're, and you're saying it's a success. Uh, success to get 100 percent of the declared material out right, and get it neutralized. Yes, that was successful. And, and Matt, come on, it's never, been, it's never been done before on that kind of a scale. All right, fine. But still, if, uh, if he Nobody's declare, turning a blind eye to the fact that he still has right, potential okay. capabilities right, in this if regard. if he didn't declare 100 percent, then I don't see how it's, a, you know, saying that he clear, saying that 100 percent of what he declared is gone, it, it's not a, you know, it's not 100 percent success. Anyway, the second thing, and very briefly, if it is okay for the Turks to go after the PKK, why aren't, why, well, why doesn't the administration also go after the PKK to help defend its NATO ally, Turkey? Uh, look, it's a foreign terrorist organization. Um, we, uh, you go after foreign terrorist organizations, Al Shabaab. You go after well, why not? Why I don't have a, I, I don't have a it? dossier on how, well, how and what to, to what degree or when or how we've gone after the PKK. It's a FTO. We recognize them as such. Right. Um, and the United States reserves the right, as we do with all FTOs, to go after them where and when we can. Okay. Well, could it could it be that the administration believes that going after the PKK <clears throat> is actually uh, harmful to it, the uh, the anti ISIS ISIL effort? We've never defended the PKK. In I'm not regard. saying you defended them. No, I'm but I mean, I, but the question is sort, of, sort of implies that we're sort of turning a blind eye to the PKK because they fight ISIL, and that's just not true. No, I, any more than it's tr any. Go uh, ahead. I'm not saying you turn a blind eye to them, but I'm saying that you have you have you haven't uh, targeted them militarily. I, I'm not going to. I I don't have ready access to military targets. Uh, PKK is an FTO. We reserve the right to go after terrorists, uh, as we do all over the world. Yes. Yesterday, President Barzani said three years of peace is better than one hour of fighting. The, he wants to help Turkey and the PKK get back to dialogue. We know that before the USA agreed to the peace process with Turkey. Are you helping them in this process, and are you helping Turkey to against fight PKK. Am I, are we helping who in this process? Turkey. Are we helping Turkey? Peace process in Turkey, yeah. Uh, we obviously want to, I mean, we would agree that, you know, peace is better than conflict. Um, uh, I don't have anything to share with respect to the degree that we're, what we're, we're helping Turkey in the peace process. Um, certainly, we want to see peace as well. Um, and as for helping Turkey go after the PKK, I'll say it again. These strikes against the PKK were done by Turkish forces in retaliation for the attacks that they received. So yeah. Don't you call, them, call upon the Turks to halt their strikes and start negotiation, or you just 
you don't have it. I, I said it before. We, we, uh, we recognize Turkey's right to defend itself so against okay terrorists. With, with Turkey bombing PKK for it's, uh, We recognize the right of Turkey to defend itself against terrorists. Yeah. Was that uh, during the negotiation to use the base, did this come up, this issue of attacking PKK? Is it the U.S. can use this base and then... No. I mean, as I said as I said to Matt, even though he thinks I'm the only person in the world that believes it, there's no connection well, no, between what they did against four. the PKK. <laughs> but they're all inside there's the There's no connection between that and the discussions uh, that we continue to have with Turkey about how to get, go after ISIL. Well, it, never, it, w it was never raised. I'm not going to get into the into the details of discussions that we have with the Turks. What I'm telling you is there's no connection between what they did against PKK and what we're going to try to do together against ISIL. Yeah. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, uh, yesterday, I, in, to answer one, one of my questions, the Pentagon Press Office, they t told me that uh, the Turkey's counter uh, attack on ISIL in Syria is not part of the co uh, coalitions. It's not under the command of the uh, joint cooperation yeah. uh, that the other, they do it independently. Yes. Is that true? Okay, yes. don't you think this is, this the, 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 the number one question is, don't you think this is going to backfire the, the entire uh, effort you have made to help the fighters on the ground to, because they, if they do it in, independently, who they are going to coordinate? Well, the, the, fact, these, these the attack, state, these specific strikes w were done in a, you know, extra coalition manner. In other words, they weren't part of co the coalition air campaign for that day. That doesn't mean that that might not change in the future. Um, again, I would let Turkey speak to the way in which they're going to contribute to coalition efforts. Uh, uh, one more on that. Uh, are you, you mentioned that PKK is still in the U.S. United States uh, ter terrorism list. Uh, so uh, are you willing, as the uh, Turkish government is willing to do so, uh, to extend the war on terrorism beyond ISIS and fighting PKK as on the same side of, of ISIS, or you do differentiate between the two, two, two groups? Uh, I think we've talked about this before. So our concern, our larger concern for the coalition is against ISIL. The Turks have agreed to improve their cooperation in, as part of the coalition against ISIL. And talks will continue to see where that cooperation can even get better over time. PKKs and FTO, talked about this before. Turks retaliated uh, with strikes against the PKK for strikes that they suffered as a result of PKK violence. Um, the PKK is a foreign terrorist organization. Turks have a right to defend themselves against it. That was separate and distinct from the fight against ISIL, which the Turks have, have now agreed to even more cooperation on. Okay. Is uh, that why, is that why um, they're doing extra, co extra operations outside of the coalition because you don't want them you don't want their military actions against the PKK to be seen as no. part of the coalition efforts. No, at least again, these are two separate things. I understand. I understand. Did you ask them specifically to do their operations against ISIL outside of the coalition no. so that the other no. operations aren't seen as part of coalition? No, there was no such request. So I, yeah, change the topic, which is great. Can we go to <laughs> another one of your favorite topics, the Palestinian Israeli? Ah, oh, you're killing me. But, but <laughs> be, be, before that, could you comment on the reports that? Uh, Israeli spy Jonathan Pollard is gets, getting set to be released uh, in November as his, there's a mandatory uh, parole or anything. you have any comments Our view on is that? he needs to serve out his sentence. I would point you to the Justice Department for right. any further but, comment on that. But That's are, you not aware, my place. are you aware of some, these reports? That I've the, seen media the, speculation uh, about it, but again, you should talk to the Justice Department. Okay. I mean, last week uh, you issued a, a strong statement, or the week before, against the demolition of uh, uh, Suiza, you know, of <coughs> Susia, I'm sorry, Susia, yeah. the, the village of Susia. Yeah. Well, today, apparently, in response to documents, like 1,881 documents that prove ownership of Palestinians, the Israelis are holding back. Are you urging them to, to, to stop the demolition altogether? Uh, I haven't seen those reports, Saeed, uh, but, but as, I, as I said in my statement, I think our policy has been very clear and consistent on this, and it's not going to change. But I'm not able to speak to the specific report. The Ministry of Justice came up with documents proving ownership of land by the Palestinians. I, I just I can't right. say you're going to have to let me take it for you. I just okay. haven't seen and that report. But again, large, bit, large, our position on settlements has <clears> not changed. Are you aware of uh, the resumption of negotiations between uh, Palestinian negotiator Saeed Barakat 
and is ready to negotiate a Salvan Shalom and I'm not. not. No. Are you are you in any way sponsoring that? I, I'm not aware of it, so I would be uh, okay. I'd be terrible. I could, couldn't speak for sponsorship of it. I'm not. I'm simply not aware of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, this morning, 125 members of Congress released a letter urging the State Department to deny visas to spouses of foreign diplomats from countries that refuse to issue visas to same-sex spouses of U.S. Foreign Service personnel. Have you seen that letter? And if so, does State have a response to that? I have not um, uh, seen the letter. Uh, but if it is, as you described, I'm sure that we will respond in uh, appropriate uh, time uh, and detail to members of Congress. Would the U.S. be able to uh, deny visas to uh, those who would be qualified for it? For those visas, I, I just don't. Let me let me look at the letter, Roz, and I, I just don't know. I'm not an expert on visa applications and how they're administered. Do you know if this is an issue that has come up at all, without quite apart from the letter? I'm not aware of it coming up, Matt. No. Can I move to Iran? Yeah, sure. Uh, would you, hey, Unless there's more on would, this. Is there more on this, or are we going to a separate topic? Okay, let me go to Matt here on Iran, and then uh, we'll come back to you guys. I, I just want to clear up one thing, because there's information coming out about the documents that you guys sent up to the Hill about the about the nuclear uh, deal, uh, and particularly related to the PMD issue, which I know we've gone over and over and over and over many times. But I just want to make sure I understand. Is it the administration's position that the Iranians can resolve or address the uh, concerns that the IAEA has about the possible military dimensions of their nuclear program without actually making an admission that they did, in fact, have a military dimension. In other words, is it the administration's position that, to use the phrase that was used over and over and over again, that Iran can come clean about the PMDs without actually coming clean about the PMDs? Um, well, as we've said before, Matt, uh, this uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is not about the past. It's about their nuclear uh, program and what it's going to look like in the future and about Iran taking the steps, proper steps, to show that they are not undertaking current or future nuclear weapons work. So that's really important. It's a forward-looking document. However, the document also spells out a very clear process to get to implementation day which includes Iran having to address specific items in its, and this is the title of the, uh, of the document, the Roadmap for the Clarification of Past and Present Outstanding Issues Regarding Iran's Nuclear Program with the IEA. If those items, past and present, are not addressed, we don't get to implementation day and there's no sanctions relief. I understand that. But is it the position of the administration that the IAEA can resolve its concerns without Iran actually coming clean about what it did in the past? Well, what we want, and we've said before, is that the IAEA's concerns, past and present, have to be addressed. Now, how that is done is largely between the IAEA and Iran. As Secretary Kerry said, we know a lot about their past. Right. So it's not about a, a coming clean statement. It's about them making sure that they've addressed past and present concerns with the IEA to the satisfaction of the IEA so that the PMD can right. be. But what I'm asking you is whether the administration believes that the IEA can resolve its concerns without Iran actually coming clean about what it did in the past. I would point you to the IEA about what they believe well, and I what know, they but, need. Yeah, but look, there, there are disagreements between the administration that there have been in the past and the IEA all the time. Iraq was a great example of that. I want to know if the, this administration believes that the IEA can do its work and resolve its concerns, address the questions it has about PMDs without Iran actually coming clean about what it did in the past. They have to, I, you're not going to like this answer because it's very much the same as what I've given you. They, I, the, Iran not, has to, I know, what you're, I know what you're asking me. The Iran, Iran has to resolve issues of the past and the present with the IEA to their satisfaction. That's what has to happen. What form that takes or who says what about it is, you know, that's between Iran and, and the IEA. We know from intelligence, we have a good sense of what their past nuclear weapons program looked like. Um, what, what needs to happen as part of this plan, which isn't just a U.S. plan, is that Iran has to address those concerns 
satisfactorily with the IAEA. But it is not a requirement for this administration that Iran actually own up to what it did in the past. As Secretary Kerry said, we know what they've done in the past. So, so, so they don't need to. They need to address the IAEA's concerns. And and they can do that without owning up. They to that's what they did. the IAEA needs to determine no, whether no, that's no, what forget they about want. We the we know what they did. Yes. This isn't about the past for us. It's about the future. But it is about the past for the IAEA. They have to satisfy the IAEA's uh, requirements with respect to past. Okay, but the, but, but the whole idea of addressing this and resolving it is a quite, it, it goes to the matter of trust and whether Iran can be trusted in the future. It, uh, you all say and have said for some time that Iran was in non-compliance with resolution after resolution after resolution of the UN Security Council. And so one would think that if you were going to be able to trust them, I, and I realize it's not about trust, about verification, but if you're going to take the step that you're going to get to the point where you even have something to verify, that they would have to show what they did in the past. Uh, because otherwise, it's, it, 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 it's like, you know, I don't know, well, it's like punishing a child or something. Telling a kid that you know he can apologize or not apologize for past bad behavior sure. without actually admitting that he did anything wrong. Well, so I don't understand why it is that you're saying now that the Iranians can address the whole issue of PMDs without admitting to what they had done or owning up to what they had done we, in the past. I think, and, I, and for it to be again, credible, we've said we don't need them to admit it. We know what they've done. I can't speak for the IEA. Yeah. I wanted to ask a technical question on the status of the agreement now. What is going on now? I mean, after it was, uh, the agreement was reached on the 14th, what is going on? Are there any kind of, you know, consultation on the phone between the P5 plus uh, one with Iran? What is going on in terms of pushing this thing forward on the diplomatic level? Or is it everything is on hold until Congress uh, decides one way or the other? Well, I mean, our, our you know, Congress has 60 days to review that. That's the period that we're in right now. So there's not any implementation of the deal, uh, uh, at least not right now. Um, we have to get through the 60 days where Secretary Kerry's been focused is on uh, working with, and he'll continue to work with members of Congress. He testified last week. He's got another hearing this week. Um, and uh, he'll continue to, to, to make himself available, as will Secretary Moniz, to members of Congress to address their concerns. Um, and that's where we are right now. We're in this 60-day review period, and the Secretary is very much focused on, on helping Congress as they work through that review. Well, there is absolutely no, let's say, diplomatic activities related to the agreement ongoing now. Well, I mean, he's in touch with his counterparts. Okay. They're all in touch with each other. But, I mean, right. the, the, they, they, too, have taken the deal back to, to their host governments, uh, you know, for consideration as well. Yes. Um, I was wondering if the department could respond to criticisms from Senator Menendez about the TIP report. He has said that it is a product of political manipulation uh, and that he's going to use all the means at his disposal to reverse upgrades to Malaysia and Cuba. So first question, a response. Second I, I haven't question. seen the senator's comments. Um, I would just point you to what Under Secretary Sewell said today. She got a question about uh, you know, the political motivations behind the report, and I thought she was quite eloquent about the, the, the rigorous analysis that, <clears throat> excuse me, that goes into the report, um, and that we stand by it. And the report's online for everybody to see and to read, and uh, we think it speaks for itself, but uh, I haven't seen the senator's uh, uh, remarks. This will be very quick. I just want to know if you guys have any response. Everyone else has been asked about it, including the president today, but I wanted to know, since it's this building that was primarily in charge, or at most Took, the, took a lead in the negotiations with Iran. If uh, you or if you're aware of the secretary having any uh, reaction to his being called, uh, being compared to Pontius Pilate by Senator Cotton, um, and whether you have any response to uh, former Governor Huckabee's comments about what this deal might mean to Israel. Uh, I think what I would, the way I'd answer that question, Matt, um, uh, is that is to say? And look, the secretary was in New York City Friday talking about this uh, quite a bit uh, with Jewish leaders. As a matter of fact, he is extraordinarily comfortable with the role he played in helping bring about this deal. He is also 
extraordinarily comfortable with the deal itself and the details in it and the degree to which it will make not just the region safer, but Israel safer, as well as our own national security interests. Is there a reason he's not going to Israel since he's going to be right next door in Egypt on this it's trip? Just, uh, it's just not part of the, the, the parameters for this trip. It's not, you know, it wasn't a deliberate decision not to go. There's an awful lot to cover in, in eight days. As you can see, it's a literally, it's a round-the-world trip. Um, he has been um, in touch with Prime Minister Netanyahu many, many times over the last several weeks uh, in, in terms of uh, d discussing the, the deal and, um, and the parameters of it. So it's not as if we aren't in constant communication with uh, Israeli counterparts about this. Again, this is a pretty aggressive agenda for a one-week trip. Do you know when the last time he was in touch with um, Prime Minister Netanyahu or any other or, or any other see. Israeli officials? The last call that I see to the Prime Minister took place on Thursday, the 16th of July. So uh, over a week ago. Yeah. Yeah, right? but that's not that long ago. No, no, I know. I'm just, but that, that was the last one. And then um, you said before, after his experience up on the Hill last week, would you say that the Secretary is looking forward to tomorrow's <laughs> testimony before the House? Yes, I think, he is. Committee? I, I think he is. Yeah, I said really? I said he was looking forward to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee meeting, and he was, and he's looking forward to meeting with House Foreign Affairs Committee members tomorrow. Angered or annoyed or insulted by uh, terms like fleeced, bamboozled, uh, naive, things like this that were no, just look, thrown about with that. He's not insulted uh, by that. Uh, he understands that there's. He understands. I know he doesn't agree with it, but that wasn't the question. The question was whether he was insulted by it. As I said to Matt's question, which was a really good question, he is extraordinarily comfortable with his, the role that he and the State Department have played in achieving this deal, and just as extraordinarily comfortable with the deal itself. And he does look forward to continuing to have discussions with members of Congress about this. Um, he recognizes that there are concerns on both sides of the aisle, and he's going to continue to address those concerns. Um, I think what the Secretary would like to see is that the hyperbole come down and that people read the deal for the deal itself. If you take time and go through it and you, and you read it and you, and you attack it objectively and factually, uh, its logic stands for itself, and I think that's where he really wants the discussion to, to go, um, into a, a fact-based, objective analysis of it. But he's not shrinking from the debate or the discussion. Um, he recognizes those concerns. He simply disagrees with the, the, uh, the criticisms of the deal. And as he pressed it last week, so too will he press well, uh, his views this week. But John, hyperbole aside, the people Many of the people, although not all, of the critics of this deal have done a fact-based, perhaps you would argue not objective, but certainly fact that they've gone sure. through it and found a lot to be critical of and found a lot to oppose. So your position is that these people are just plain wrong, right? I'm, the Secretary's position is that many of the criticisms of the deal, the 24 days, the uh, the uh, 10 to 15 year sunset, the $100 billion windfall of cash that, that Iran's going to, you know, somehow pump into nefarious activities. I mean, the Secretary's view is that those criticisms are not well-founded. He expressed his, his, uh, his answers to those last week, and he'll do it again this week. Yeah, yeah, I got time for just, I got really, I got I to gotta get going. I got to get going. Yeah, Elliot, yeah, thanks. you feeling better? Yeah, thank you Good. for your concern. Um, I was just, uh, I was wondering if you could respond to the new Russian naval doctrine that was released over the weekend, if you have any uh, we've see, We've seen it. I mean, obviously, every nation uh, with a navy um, uh, publishes these kinds of uh, uh, documents uh, uh, outlining uh, the policies, the strategies that they're going to pursue. Uh, I would let the Russian government uh, speak for themselves about, uh, about this doctrine. Um, uh, we... We have a national military time. Mer I'm sorry, a national military strategy of our own, which has a maritime component of it. Um, and uh, look at the the oceans are big and vast. There's lots of challenges out there at sea. Ninety percent of all trade travels by sea, um, and uh, there's no reason for 
the seas to be uh, an area of conflict. In other words, that it doesn't concern us that they have a naval doctrine. No, or that they're calling for an expanded military presence in the Atlantic. The Atlantic's, a, the Atlantic's a, a, a big ocean. I mean, freedom of the seas doesn't just apply to whales and icebergs, and um, you know, uh, it doesn't. And uh, but it's how you operate on the seas that matter. Um, and it's how, it, and it's it's the posture, it's the threats, it's the challenges. And the United States Navy, the United States military is. Uh, uh, the most most powerful in the world, and uh, look for we look as we continue to do with all nations areas where we can cooperate better uh, on the oceans. That's always that's always welcome. But you know we'd have to pick apart this doctrine to you know, and I'm sure the Pentagon's doing that. John. Yeah, thank Go you, on. sir. A couple of questions, South Asia. Um, Mr. Tariq uh, uh, Fatmi, the special advisor to Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif of Pakistan, was in Washington, and he was addressing the Heritage Foundation where he said that he was knocking the doors of the administration and the U.S. Congress that they should intervene between India and Pakistan's conflict. Any comment on that? Um, no, I mean, I don't have anything more to add other than what we've said before, Goyal, that you know, we want to see the conflict and the tension reduced, that this is, these are issues that need to be worked out between India and Pakistan. And second, he was also saying that uh, as far as uh, pre Press freedom in Pakistan is concerned that uh, the journalist in Pakistan can trash the prime minister. But uh, now, according to the Washington Post yesterday, front page story, journalists are being killed in Pakistan, and also they are running, uh, especially one Mir, uh, uh, um, Mir, uh, uh, his name is uh, uh, Mir uh, Hamid. He's running around a very famous and well-known TV journalist in Pakistan. He was attacked uh, because he spoke against the military and ISI, and his show is a capital uh, show on his TV. Uh, look, I think I just say we've made our, our deep concerns about freedom of the press very clear and known all over the world and in all manner of places, and that, that, you know, that includes certainly includes Pakistan. We are very, very clear about the importance of a free press um, and reporters able to do their jobs uh, unintimidated and, and not harassed. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.